welcome to the Wild Bill Greer Memorial, celebrating the life of an outstanding American hero. And what better MC to have than a fellow, a fellow Philadelphian who also exhibited strength and determination, made the Philadelphia Eagles as a walk-on, the invincible Vince Papali. How's everybody doing tonight? You feeling invincible, huh? Oh, man, and you're coming out on uh, tough weather like this and going against the Phillies and, of course, the Flyers. And uh, I'm sure on behalf of the Guarneri family, they can't thank you enough for coming. And they're going to express that, uh, that thanks as we go through the evening. As you know, and John had just said, uh, I'm the lucky one. My name's Vince Papali. And I, t I can't begin to tell you how honored I am to be your MC tonight. And actually, I'm really humbled. Uh, when, when Bill Guarnier's family had asked me and approached me and said, would I come up and speak on his behalf? I mean, like, I'm just a football guy, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, you know, my story, as they say, inspired a city to believe in the little guy achieving their dreams. And while Bill Guarnier's story continues to inspire generations of proud men and women who strive to serve their country with dignity, with grace, and good humor. After all, he's an American legend who saved the world. He'll tell you that. And he, like his fellow members of Easy Company, gave their life and limbs to protect and serve. And there are real, true heroes. And tonight we're here to honor one of them from our, they are, so please applaud, absolutely. So of course, you're all here and we're all here to honor one of them from this great city of Philadelphia, and as they said, the greatest of all generations. And what can I possibly say when human words uh, fail to capture the superhuman strength and the honor and courage this man possessed? Uh, like I said, I'm a football guy, and I practiced hard. I played hard. Uh, thank my lucky stars. I was given the chance to live out my dream, playing pro ball right here in Philadelphia for the Eagles and Dick Vermeil, a group of talented, admired athletes. I caught the leather. Uh, I smashed helmets, smashed a few punt return guys, too. That was fun. And I heard thousands of people cheering me on, but it was different cheers that Bill Guarneri heard. Uh, he was a soldier, and instead of tossing pig skins, he tossed grenades, and as you'll find out, he even tossed a few green apples. And instead of running the field, for, uh, he fearlessly charged into enemy territory. And instead of hearing thousands of people cheering him on, he answered the anguished cries of millions by giving hell to their captors. And that thought is humbling. You think about it. This man, this hero, he's iconic for so much more than a lost leg or a funny nickname. He's iconic for the selfless, selflessness he showed in putting his life on the line every day to protect the, comp the country he loved so fiercely. And he had that incredible humor which kept his brothers in easy company going and for the honor with which he continued to serve long past his discharge. And yet, even with his valiant resume, he was modest. He didn't boast openly about his heroics. He didn't brag about his history, uh, nor did he utilize that history to gain sympathy. Instead, he rode to every challenge with grace and fortitude. He retained his casual South Philly attitude and never felt pulled to the life of celebrity that he really was and celebrated as. But you'll hear more about that from the ones who loved and knew him best. Tonight, we come together in his memory, and I and his family ask that you take the example of Wild Bill Granary's life and strive to emulate his intrinsically strong, noble character. You'll hear from many people with whom he touched in his lifetime, family he cared for, friends of all ages who loved him, and other great people who had admired what he had done for history. Tonight, together, we will all celebrate the life of this iconic man, Wild Bill Granary. All right, thank you. And if you would all please rise for our national anthem being sung tonight by a cappello by Aaron Smith.
what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red cloud the bombs bursting in hell gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh oh say does that star Thank you, Aaron. That was pretty great, huh? Like everybody here, she volunteered her time, too. And uh, she also um, doubles as a midwife. Can you believe that? Uh, before we bring our next uh, group of people up, I, I thought my, what I'd do is I'd share with you uh, part of a eulogy that was written and said by uh, Debbie Rafferty, his granddaughter, at uh, the funeral for Wild Bill, and uh, it was mostly uh, part of it, and, and it was about, you know, well, what were the family's thoughts, you know, like in one word? What would you describe your uncle, your father, your grandfather, and how would you describe him? Well, uh, you know, he had several nicknames. He was Wild Bill. Um, he was also known as, uh, as Debbie had said, as Gramps, uh, by, as Dad, Uncle Billy, uh, South Philly Willie, and of course, if you watch Band of Brothers, he was known as gonorrhea, right? And, uh, but, you know, when you ask his family, well, you know, what do you think about him? And, and some of the one words that you would say that he is, this is what they said about him, th this great man. They said he was fearless. He was brave, honest most of the time. Well, they say he was more like brutally honest, right? Um, he was easygoing. That wasn't until you pissed him off. Uh, he was very thoughtful, sweet, a jokester, sincere, and kind, and he just adored his wife, protected his family, and man, did he ever love South Philly and the string bands. And right now, I'd like to introduce to you the Quaker City String Band. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, right from downtown, our string band, Quaker City String Band.
Look, I, I was in a company for four years. I went, I joined the Army in 1938, 15 years old. Why? Mom had ten children. I was a baby. How could you feed ten kids and close them? Ten. Got rid of two of us, me and Oini. I went to CMTC three years. Going to be an officer. By the time three years come up, World War II started. So I joined the Pirate Troopers. And I got the nickname Wild Bear because before D-Day, I received notice from my brother, my buddy Johnny Martin, his wife wrote his wife, and his wife wrote Pat, and Pat wrote my wife, and they wrote to Johnny Martin telling me your brother was killed in, in the, uh, Italy. That was right before D-Day. I got news for you. You didn't want to be a joining on D-Day when Wild Bill was there. <laughs> <laughs> Just part of his great humor. Um, I played for one of the greatest coaches in, uh, in NFL history, if not Philadelphia lawyer, of course, and that's Dick Vermeil. And uh, he had this great, yeah, yeah, thank you. Isn't he, isn't he great? Man, he still loves you back, you know that. And uh, one of his great quotes was this, and it was all about opportunity. He said, an opportunity is worth to a person exactly what their preparation enables them to make it. And, uh, and nobody took advantage of opportunities more than our next guest and, and our first presenter, and that's Dom Giordano uh, from 1210 WPHT. Uh, you can hear him weekdays from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. And uh, they say, which Philadelphia talk show host can judge the Miss Kensington pageant one day? And then he's talking with Mayor Nutter about a new day in Philadelphia. And of course, that's Dom. And he offers an intelligence guy next door sensibility that's as comfortable as your favorite chair. Uh, he was born and raised in South Philly. Uh, his local flavor makes him one of the region's best connected media personalities. And Dom Giordano's mix of compelling topics, great local callers, and provocative guests produces fascinating talk radio. Dom began his unique path to broadcasting as a high school teacher, believe it or not, in Delaware Valley. And he received widespread media coverage for his innovative teaching and motivational techniques with his students. Uh, he started with WWDB, remember them, back in 1987, and he became the country's first teacher-turned uh, talk show host. That's an alliteration, and it's called Talkers Magazine, and he was named back in the day as one of the top 100 most influential talk show hosts in America. He lives in Germantown now with his family, and I uh, would like to introduce to you right now, please welcome Dom Giordano. Hey everyone, I'm honored to be here tonight. I first met Wild Bill, I think about 15 years ago at WWDB, the old radio station. And immediately, in addition to everything else about him, I'm from South Philly, he's from South Philly. The thing that I thought about Wild Bill, and you got that chuckle at the end of his own tribute, not only was he a man of great character, but he was a character. And this is the city of characters. I often said that about people like Joey Vento, also South Philly, people like Wild Bill. There is something about this town that produces that or thrives on that. The difference is that Wild Bill was internationally famous due to the Band of Brothers. And I always thought that he and his colleague, Babe Heffron, were also the face, one of the big faces of the greatest generation. I've interviewed Tom Brokaw several times about that. He's the one that probably coined that. And when you see guys like this, and we've all seen the films, they lived it, of what happened on D-Day and the like, it is remarkable. I don't know in today's atmosphere if they'd be able to storm those beaches given the terrible cost, given how touch and go it was. And uh, I don't know that film, maybe, uh, maybe Spielberg captured it best. So Wild Bill was someone that was always there that periodically we'd talk with in talk radio. When you have a guy like this, this connected to the greatest generation, this much a character, this funny, this type of guy that might say anything, of course you go to him. But he kind of fell off our radar screen here and there until just last spring, I think it was right around this time, his nephew, Anthony, calls me. Now those of you that know 
talk radio and how it works. We have seven or eight phone lines. We're talking about just about anything in the world. We get this call. Thank God I had a good producer who put him through. He gets on the air live, 50,000 watt radio station. We do reach 38 states in Canada and says, they're coming to take away Wild Bill's handicapped parking sign, the city of Philadelphia. And they will not, they will literally not stop. And Anthony apparently gets the medals, is running outside. This is all live on the air going back and forth. I have people dropping everything and saying they want to get to South Philly. I have two military guys, Joe Eastman and his colleague, Chris Hill. I'm not sure if either are here tonight, probably one of them at least. They drop everything. The one wants to get 200 of his buddies to go over there and put the sign back up immediately. Core heads prevail, sort of, and within days, thanks to city council, thanks to people like Councilman David O, who's here tonight, and others, not only did they restore that sign in front of Wild Bill's house, but they had a statute or regulation passed that in the future, when you're taking away the handicapped parking sign in this bureaucratic nightmare, if it's a veteran, you have to go through a number of special procedures to do this type of outrageous act. And I was thinking about it. Here's Wild Bill, even at that point in life, even at that in condition of life, changing something for the better. Uh, you know, even, uh, I don't know, uh, storming D-Day versus the bureaucracy in Philadelphia, which one's harder? But he did change it. You know, we couldn't stop him on the air, but it gave people something of meaning. It connected them to this guy, and it gave us a chance to tell his story. Those of you that are listeners know or you read in the media, it resulted in our man of the year at the big event that we do every year, the Feast of the Seven Fishes. I don't know that Wild Bill knew all the seven fishes. He might have in South Philly. I'm not sure of the heritage. It's not just an Italian thing, but he was our person of the year. And even with people like Rick Santorum and uh, Charlie Gracie and Bobby Rydell there, the star of the night, everybody wanted to go over to his table and talk with him last December right down the street here in uh, North Broad at V. He was that type of character and man of character, sorely missed. So when I told listeners that we would be doing this and put this up on Facebook when Debbie contacted me and we had her on the air, people immediately suggested, and I hope it does happen because we're behind it and some people have contacted me, that we erect a statue to Wild Bill and his colleague, Babe Heffron. We put it someplace of prominence in Philadelphia, looking over all of us, and as a true and great last homage to the greatest generation. And I hope, all right, I take that as a yes. The ushers, get your baskets. Let's collect right now. David O, I'm appointing you chairman of this. You can make this happen. So I, I think uh, backstage are people and others that may talk about this. Uh, this was spontaneous from listeners. That's what they thought of. And every time I would bring up Wild Bill or Babe or the two of them, you know, to be honest, occasionally we'd get the caller who wouldn't get it and say, well, why are we not talking about all the World War II veterans? What about Vietnam veterans? What about Korean War veterans, arguably the most forgotten? And we, we try to pay homage to all of them. And Wild Bill, every time that we had him on, every time that we saw him in person, would always go out of his way that his celebrity, if you will, from the Band of Brothers was extended to everybody that's ever put on the uniform everybody that's ever been in a line of fire or was just greatly inconvenienced and spent time away from their home and family protecting all of us. That's what he was about. It wasn't about him. He used that and all these things that were done around him to talk about the greatest generation and to talk about the military. He was selfless in that. But you can't help it. Some people are just stars. I mean, I'm in the business of communications. They're funny. They're charismatic. You know, they just have a way of projecting that. This man projected all those values and more. Probably the best thing that I read about him preparing for this is not just what he did to heroism, but for what, 65, 67 years afterward, he kept that band of brothers together. He kept up with them. He, he uh, brought them good news and bad news, this great cadre. and. Uh, the most thrilling moment I've seen recently, we were thinking about him and mentioned him, when sadly we had the government shutdown in Washington, 
And those World War II veterans, the guys that scaled D-Day, if you remember, when they opened those gates, some of them in wheelchairs, to get to the World War II Memorial, I don't think these guys were inconvenienced. I think they kind of enjoyed it. I think that's the type of thing they lived for. And that's what they meant to us. So I'm honored to be here tonight. There are a lot of great people to speak. More to come on this statue idea. We lost two of the greatest, but their memory lives on with us and the things that they stand for. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me tonight. All right, thank you, Dom Giordano. Flyers won nothing. You know, he brought it up. I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm going to, so I'm going to bring it up. Anybody see Invincible here in the house? All right. <laughs> I hope you liked it. <laughs> Anybody cry? <laughs> I'm like Coach Romeo. I cry every time I see it. Yeah, it kills me. I get no residuals. brings me to my knees. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I sort of brought that up because we were talking about Band of Brothers. And, uh, you know, when I had been asked to... Uh, to be the MC and, and have the honor of doing that. And, and uh, I, you know, one of the first things I do anyway is I, I'm going to start doing some research. And first thing we had done was we started watching Band of Brothers. And, you know, when they make that movie about you, they're going to stretch it. They're going to stretch it just a little bit. So, you know, I decided, well, I, I wanted to find out a little bit about some of the truth, you know, the backstory. And, and, and I thought I'd just share with you a couple seconds on just a tremendous backstory here with the man that we're honoring tonight before I bring out our next guest who's going to introduce two others. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of a trilogy here tonight, so it's going to be a little bit funny. Uh, and we're going to call an audible, so uh, you'll see what that is in just a second. But while Bill uh, was just six months away from graduating from South Philly High School in December of 1941 when the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, so he left school and he started walk, working for Bald, Baldwin Locomotive Works, and that's, of course, an American builder of railroad locomotives. They were based in Philly and also in Eddystone, and I'm from Glen Olden, and they made battle tanks for the Army. But his mom was a little bit upset that he didn't get his high school degree. So in order to satisfy and to placate his mom and maybe uh, not get the switch or the belt like we used to back in the day, he switched to the night shift, finished high school, and eventually earned his diploma before going into the Army, which I think is just a tremendous story. So that tells you a little bit about him and his love for his family. I'm going to introduce to you, we have, and everybody here has a program, correct? And in, in the program has the bios. And, uh, and I'm going to forego with the bios right now because we're going to have several men come up. So rather than do that, you can see them when they do come up. And I would like to introduce to you uh, Councilman David O. And, of course, he's been active with the Philadelphia community for over 25 years. And he's coming right now for recognition, please. So if Councilman O, if you please would <laughs> welcome him. And he's going to bring up a couple more of our surprise guests. Thank you. Hi, right, Councilman. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask Councilman James Kenny to come out, and I see Councilman Mark Squilla, and I'll ask him to come up their steps over there to join me, because this is a council resolution by all the members of uh, City Council. If there are any other council persons, please uh, come and join us. Uh, while he's uh, making his way here, let me just say that uh, I'm truly honored, as we all are. Uh, I see Scott Brown, the uh, Executive Director of our Veterans Advisory Commission, uh, Wild Bill, Bill Guineer, uh, not just a hero in World War II, but a hero through and through afterwards. Uh, everyone here knows the stories about him, how he was there for so many veterans, so many veterans' causes, even when he wasn't feeling well, even when he was ill. He never said no. He always showed up. I had a group of young uh, officers running 500 miles when they stopped in Philadelphia they met Wild Bill Guineer. I'm sure the photographs and the memories uh, are something very special to them. And this is special to us. I'm going to begin reading with uh, Councilman Mark Squilla, and uh, Councilman uh, James Kenny is going to share his tribute. Um, this is a resolution recognizing and honoring the life and service of William Wild Bill Guineer. Whereas William Guarneri, the youngest of 10 children, was born on April 28, 
1923 in South Philadelphia to Joseph and Augusta Guarneri. And whereas during the Great Depression, William Guarneri joined the Citizens Military Training Camp program where he spent three years before the program was canceled due to the anticipated war in Europe. And whereas on August 31, 1942, William Guarneri enlisted in the Army Airborne and started his training in Georgia at Camp uh, Tukal. And whereas William Guarneri was assigned to Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506, Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. His first combat jump as a paratrooper was into occupied France the night before D-Day as part of the mass invasion and earned the nickname Wild Bill due to his reckless attitude and strong hatred towards the enemy. And Excuse me. Whereas Wild Bird earned, earned a rank as sergeant, however, further cementing his nickname, he, was, he went against direct orders and opened fire on German platoon, leading to an eventual court martial and demotion to private. And whereas in 1944, during a battle of the Bulge, while holding the line southwest of Foy, Belgium, a massive artillery onslaught hit his team in their position, resulting in the loss of Wild Bill's right leg and ending his participation in the war. And whereas in March of 1945, Wild Bill returned to Philadelphia and became active in numerous veteran organizations and presided over many easy company reunions. And whereas William Gornier received the following medals and decorations for his service during World War II, a silver star, two bronze stars with oak leaf clusters, two purple hearts with oak leaf clusters, a presidential unit citation, one oak leaf cluster, a gold conduct medal, European African Middle Eastern campaign medal with three service stars, an arrowhead device, a World War II victory medal, a Croix de Corps croix with palm, a French a liberation medal, combat infantry badge, a parachutist badge with two compact jump stars, and whereas William Wildbear Guarneri was portrayed for his courage and selfless <coughs> abandon in combat in the 2001 critically acclaimed HBO miniseries Band of Brothers and became one of Philadelphia's most recognized and celebrated military heroes. And whereas in 2007, his book, Brothers in Battle, Best of Friends, Two World War II Paratroopers from the Original Band of Brothers Tell Their Story, was published by Ber Berkeley Publishing Group, and whereas William Guarneri passed away on March 8, 2014, at the age of 90. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Philadelphia recognizes and honors the life and service of William Wild Bill Guarneri. Further resolved that an engrossed copy of this resolution be presented to the Guarneri family, further evidencing the sincere admiration and respect of this legislative body. It is uh, signed by all members of council. And if we can present this to the family <clears throat> on behalf of the citizens of the city of Philadelphia and a grateful nation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this wonderful ceremony. Um, I'm honored to be here, and our council members and all of our council members are honored to have supported this and, and voted for this resolution. Um, Mark Squill and I are from South Philly, so when it comes to Bill, and I want to bring up Babe because I think Bill and Babe are synonymous with each other, and since we didn't have a chance to really say our, our fond farewell to Babe in the way we wanted to, we, I wanted to bring his name into this today, too. Um, the thing about them... Um, is that they were 23 years old uh, when they left our country, left our continent, and went across the sea to fight probably the most, um, the largest and most equipped army the world had ever seen at that point. And we're all very lucky today because they and their comrades, and there are almost 10,000 uh, American heroes who are buried in the American cemetery at Normandy. And the average age of all those folks that are buried there is 24 years of age. Bill and Babe are 23. The average age of the American Cemetery occupants are 24, 24. And to think about today when our young people are sometimes a little out of sorts and not knowing where they're going uh, and, and trying to find their way in the world, these young men and women 
uh, gave their, their youth, Bill gave his leg, uh, to keep us free. Because if we had lost Normandy, if we had lost D-Day, Europe would have fallen. And we would be a different country today than we, are, than we are living in today. So I want to thank them and all their comrades for giving their country their lives, their youth, and their body parts to keep us free in this, in this country that we live in today. <clears throat> can, I, can I just see a show of hands, everyone in the room who knew, talked to, had a drink with, was insulted by, or laughed at Bill or Babe? Can all raise your hand? I think we are all extra, extremely more lucky than just living in this country because we knew who they were. And the thing about them that I really do, do, I really appreciate it and always will remember, is they never lost their South Phillyism. Bill was an Italian American from South Philly, and Babe was an, the quintessential Irish American from South Philly, and they never lost their sense of humor. And the first time I met Bill was at a 5K run at um, uh, Irish Second Street Irish Society 5K run, and he was of course a celebrity, more celebrity then because the the TV show was on, and Babe and he were on this on the on the uh, on the stage, wishing everyone well in their race. And before the race, I was brought over by one of the members of the organizing committee and was introduced to Bill. And he said to me, uh, Kenny, Kenny, he said, are you a politician? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, that's okay, kid. Everybody has to do something in life. Don't worry. <laughs> and that's, the, they just never lost it. I, was, I remember walking down, this babe, would, babe would wait for a bus at 4th and Market Street, on, often on his way to the turf club to, to bet some ponies, um, and then go back in the afternoon to watch him on television. Um, and he would see it. both of the both of their brains stayed with them, and they were sharp as tacks until the end. And I was walking up Market Street from Third, and he was standing at the bus stop at Fourth, and I could see him doing that little. He recognized who I was, and he was shaking his head. And he looked at his watch, and he said, "It's Saturday. It's nine o'clock. What are you politicians doing up so early?" <laughs> I said, "Nice to see you, babe. Good to see you." And he told me he was going to bet on the horses, and um, he was going to go home and watch them. And I hope he won. And I walked a few steps away, and he said, Kenny? I said, yeah, babe. He said, come here a minute. I said, what? He said, I want to tell you something. He said, there's no amount of money in this world that's worth your reputation. I was like, OK. I said, I know that. I said, I know that, babe. He said, I know you know it, but I'm just reminding you. <laughs> They were, they, were, they were fabulous people, and I want to just tell you one story about Bill's, about Bill's funeral. I attended the funeral in South Philadelphia. When the funeral was over, I jumped in a cab on Snyder Avenue, <clears throat> and I went back to work at City Hall. And I'm waiting. As I get out of the cab, I can see the processions coming, our highway patrol officers leading the procession of, ba of Bill's hearse, and up the street it's coming. And I'm telling you, there was a silence and a reverence that came over the sidewalk. People moved to the curb, and I so, so, saw the... the, 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 the uh, the group coming up from like Locust Street. And I could see people beginning to move to the curb. And I think they knew who was passing them by. And they stopped and they got silent. Some people blessed themselves and other men who probably were men and women who were veterans saluted. <clears throat> and it was like his final passing around City Hall on, on his way to his final rest. And I could tell you, I was more proud of our city right then who could recognize a guy like Bill who did as much as he did for us and have that moment of silence and that moment of reverence. And I will tell you, right, your, the entire Guanier family, I just really admire you. I, he, he was so proud of all of you. He was so proud of being from South Philly. He was so proud of being airborne. And I just want to thank, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. And let's keep them all in our memories. Thank you. Vince Papali told you there was going to be a couple audibles. Here's the first one. Uh, the city of Philadelphia, a word in this to the Garnieri family, I fell asleep in the back room. But uh, actually, to accept this award, my cousins, Gene and Bill. You only got, you got two minutes, Gene. One old timer, my older brother. Hurry up. How much time do we have? Are they talking about our, fa our father? The guys that hit us with the strap all the time? 
I just told Actually, her. my mother, while wow, Fran used to beat us, remember that? Oh, my God, she used to pull my side. My mother used to hit us with the belt, and my brother get under the covers on top of, underneath me. And he started screaming, ow, ow. You can see the difference now, right? Yeah, right. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight, and the uh, string band, and young ladies singing the national anthem, and all this stuff. And I'd be, be remiss if I didn't thank Mr. Bapali. Can I call him Mr. Bapali? Or Vince? Vince is really, he said he's just a football guy, but he's, I had the pleasure of meeting him before the uh, proceedings in the, uh, the green room, which, by the way, is, is blue, and uh, him and his lovely wife, a really nice guy, and he's, he's more than a football guy. He's just a great, great human being. I'd like to thank him for taking his time out of his busy schedule to come here tonight and speak on behalf of my father. Thank you, Vince. We really appreciate it. You're up. I'd like to thank the Academy, my wife, yeah. my kids, and my mistress. Uh, no, my, bro my brother said it all. My brother said it all. We do thank everybody from com for coming here. Uh, I know a lot of you people here, and I know a lot of people have touched his life. And every time I would go down his house, somebody would be there. And this is the God's honest truth. I'd go in, there'd be two women, and I'd say, Dad, who? He says, these broads, I don't know who the frig they are. And pe people would just visit them. They were from Kentucky. They just happened to be in the neighborhood, and they brought him a cheesesteak. And he couldn't eat the bread, so he just pulled the meat out and ate that. But thank you, all right? Yeah. And thank you, babe. Saintly, kid, saintly. Thanks a lot, everybody. I just say special thanks to Buddy Yeager, so, uh, Officer Yeager back there for coming, taking care of my dad. Thank you. Uh, they had to take that act on the road, man. Um, Here's another audible. I know that Jim had talked about anybody who had had a drink, no, was insulted by Wild Bill. Anybody here who has served our country, please stand up, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the dream alive. Thank you very much. And you know, you can serve your country in, in many ways other than just being in the military service. And I'm uh, reminded of a young man that's right there in front of me. I'm going to embarrass the heck out of him. Yeah, you know, Judge, Eric Spivak and his family, they're right there. Uh, on Thanksgiving, I, I went, uh, Janet and I, we went to the dark side. We're living over in Cherry Hill, New Jersey right now. Sorry about that. And, um, and every Thanksgiving, uh, the troops were being deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever they were going, and they came out of McGuire Air Force Base. And they would load all the troops from Atlanta. They were from all over. They had no idea where they were going. They would just load them into a bus and would run them down to, what was the name of the uh, Hotel of the Americas uh, on, on, uh, on Route 70, right there by Bishop Eustis, where our kids go, anyway. Uh, so that's where we went. And there was a dinner, a Thanksgiving dinner, that was organized and basically hosted by this man right here. So if you would, please, Eric, if it just, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but what you do and what you do for the troops. Uh, thank you very much. So, love you, man. And of course, I wouldn't be remiss without introducing my, uh, my wife, and she's not a Giants fan, by the way, and there's my wife, Janet. So if you would, Janet. And her sister, Lynn, and husband, David, who was also a military veteran. So thank you very much. And um, I, th before we bring out our uh, the next video clip, it is, um, again, just a little bit of research. I was doing some research on, on, on Easy Company and, and, and also uh, Wild Bill. And this is, a, uh, this is a quote from Easy Company historian Jake Powers. And uh, it goes like this. He said, he was without a doubt one of the bravest and best soldiers in all of Easy Company. He was one of the best combat leaders, not only in his company, but also the division. If there was a fight going on with the first platoon or the third platoon, Bill would miracul miraculously show up and leave second platoon to go help. Uh, he would march to the sound of gunfire. He had no reservations and was just as fearless a man in combat. And, uh, and, and he loved his grenades and he also sort of one time decided to toss a few apples as grenades, as this video will tell you. I hope you like it. The Dutch had nothing. They were in the German occupation for four, four and a half years. They had nothing. And I remember that what they gave us was, if they had milk, they gave you a glass of milk or any kind of milk, which they had, 
or a cheese, which is a luxury for them, but they had apples. And they gave us so many apples that you couldn't eat them. So I was just taking the apples and putting them here, putting them in the pocket, you know, from the people. I put them in the pocket, but then I looked like a balloon. I never forgot that the first encounter we had with the Germans, I'm going to throw grenades at them. <laughs> I couldn't stop throwing apples. And all I much have thought it was a secret weapon. And I said to myself, I'm going to get killed. I'm throwing apples at the Germans. Uh, but so full of apples that I couldn't, couldn't get down to the ground, just grab them and throw them. Like when I, I got rid of the apples real fast. Didn't do any damage with the apples? No, I mean, the Germans, so what the hell is a green thing over there? It's an apple. <laughs> You know, so it was funny as I, when I look back on it, it wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> I was throwing apples at the Germans, and they were ducking too. <laughs> oh man, we uh, we were next up going to have Admiral uh, Admiral Joe Sestak come, uh, but um, there was a death in his family. His brother passed. And uh, he can't make it this evening. And uh, so if you would, uh, you know, keep him and his family and his brothers and thoughts and prayers um, in your hearts. And, and uh, to pay tribute uh, on behalf of Admiral Joe Sestak and also on behalf of Wild Bill, uh, I'm going to bring out my friend. And uh, he's uh, Senator Jim Beach. And his father is here, and he's going to tell you all about it because he's also a World War II veteran. So if you would, Senator Beach from the great state of New Jersey. Uh, buddy. First, I'd like to thank the Garnieri family for reaching across the river and inviting me over to, uh, to speak this evening. Um, I think I'm a New Jersey senator basically because of the things I learned growing up at Second and Tree and going to Mount Carmel. So thanks for having me here tonight. I, I, and the, <laughs> Guys from Jersey, don't wrap me out. But on behalf of uh, our New Jersey State Senate President, Steve Sweeney, and the entire South Jersey legislative delegation, I have a proclamation from the state of New Jersey recognizing Wild Bill for his many accomplishments and saluting him for his dedication, sacrifice, and love of our country. But the first thing I'd like to do is introduce my dad, Elmer Beach. Dad? My dad's a World War II Marine, and I said, well, they want you to come up on the stage with me, but you don't have to speak. And he goes, oh, I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> and I would publicly like to thank you, Dad, as being your oldest son, for not naming me Elmer. <laughs> and when you look at my dad's DD-214, you'll see five very chilling words, chilling to me anyway. It says Guam, Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Iwo Jima, and Purple Heart recipient. Thank you, Dad, love you. I first met uh, Wild Bill probably 10 years ago when my dad and his uh, buddy from Sacred Heart, Babe Heffron, introduced me to Bill at a lunch. And I sat there just totally amazed listening to story after story. And then finally, I couldn't help, I said, I have to ask you two guys a question. How did two kids from South Philly that didn't even know where the Philadelphia airport was located join the paratroopers. So they looked at me like I was crazy and started laughing, and they go, it's very simple. They paid an extra 20 bucks a month. <laughs> That's a true story. I told them how impressed I was sitting with American heroes. And uh, again, they started laughing, and they said, 
no, we're, we're not heroes. We just did our job. And I said, no, no, no. I, I read Stephen Ambrose's book. I know Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks also read the book. And you really are heroes. Um, they said, you know, Stephen Ambrose could have written that book about a thousand other units of US servicemen serving around the world defending our country. And I thought about that and I said, wow, they're really special guys. And I said, well, no, I, I really do think you are heroes. He goes, nah, the real heroes are the men and women that didn't come home. And uh, I always, I'll never forget that. I would like to conclude um, by saying what I think Babe Heffron would say to Bill if he were here tonight. I think he would say, Sergeant Garnier, thank you for your courage and leadership in battle. Thank you for your sacrifices, the sacrifices that you made so that all of our families could enjoy freedom. Thank you for the love of our country and for being a role model for so many patriotic young men and women in uniform. And most of all, thank you for your lifelong friendship. And may you rest in peace and in the palm of God's hand. And may, <coughs> because you've earned it. And may God bless you, and may God bless America. Thank you, and God bless you. I loved that we had a beer with him. That would have been a lot of fun, I'll tell you. Oh, my goodness. Two nothing, by the way. Um, this is going to be pretty cool because we just heard the, um, the amateur version of I'll Be Seeing You, and we have the honor of having Samantha Joy Perlman, uh, devotedly, sincerely yours, and she's going to perform I'll Be Seeing You and she's accompanied by Trevor Pierce. So please welcome Samantha and Trevor.
Oh, it's fun back there, though. And then afterwards, there's the green room. That'll be a lot of fun. Excuse me, the one that's the blue room, the green room, whatever. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a special presentation coming out in just a second. But uh, I first of all want to read um, a little bit of a bio about somebody by the name of Dale Dye. And he served in Vietnam uh, with the United States Marine Corps for three tours, survived 31 major combat operations. He's highly decorated, including three Purple Hearts for wounds that he suffered in combat. And he spent 13 years as an enlisted Marine. Uh, he rose to the rank of Master Sergeant uh, before he was chosen to attend Officer Candidate School. And then he was appointed a Warrant Officer in 76. And later converting his commission was a captain when he was sent to Beirut uh, with the Multinational Peacekeeping Force in 1982 and 1983. And he, uh, he's a historian. And he wrote a letter about, of course, Wild Bill and also we have a letter that was written by Tom Hanks about Wild Bill. And to read that letter is Jill Horner. And uh, Jill, if you don't know, is a former Miss New Jersey and a proven television talent with a decade of on-air and producing experience. And she has 10 years of TV experience as a show host, producer, morning show reporter, traveled all over the place. What the heck? Here's Jill. She'll tell you all about it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Vince. And thank you so much for having me as a part of this. I'm really honored to be here. And thanks to Debbie, one of Bill's grandchildren, for inviting me. Like many of you, I'm guessing, I met Wild Bill on a dance floor. I was Miss New Jersey, and he asked me to dance. I was a little concerned that a man who was 80-something years old on crutches was going to have a difficult time on the dance floor. I should have been more concerned that I couldn't keep up with him. He told me, I never miss a chance to dance with a pretty girl, so get moving. <laughs> Tonight, we honor that spirit, his service, and his sense of fun. And now, a few thoughts and memories from just one more person who was honored to know him. The official record indicates a number of talented people were responsible for the monumental TV series Band of Brothers. But those of us who were privileged to work on that project knew the real directors were real men like Dick Winters, Babe Heffron, Shifty Powers, and especially Wild Bill Guarneri. For the year it took us to make Band of Brothers, those men were always on our minds and in our hearts. Whatever we did, in front of the cameras or behind them, we had one mandate, one question that kept us on track. Would men like Wild Bill approve of what we were doing? If the answer was no, we did it again and again, until we felt all the men of Easy Company would be proud of how we portrayed them, their service, and heroic sacrifices in World War II. For a couple of wonderful days in England while we were making the series, we were privileged to have Wild Bill, Babe, and a couple of other Easy Company veterans on location to watch us work. It was a lot like having a combination drill sergeant and football coach staring over our shoulders, and Wild Bill was quick to let us know when we were drifting away from the way it was with him and his buddies back in 1944. I will never forget Bill watching one of our actors fumbling around trying to speed load an M1 rifle. He stood it as long as he could. He then dropped his crutches, snatched the rifle out of the actor's hands, loaded it in one smooth practice motion, and handed it back. Nice work, I complimented Bill. He just shrugged, recovered his crutches. Some stuff you just never forget, he said, especially when it's stuff that'll save your ass. <laughs> then there was the time in Paris. We were showing the completed band of brothers for the first time. We were very busy with press conferences and glad handing, 
But Wild Bill and Babe had carved out a place at the hotel bar. They wanted me to join them for beer, but I was distracted. Wild Bill, I said without thinking, I'd love to join you, but I'm busier than a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. <laughs> Wild Bill just leaned on his crutches and grinned at me. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Over the years since that time, I was honored to spend a little time with Wild Bill, and he was always gracious, caring, concerned. He took his acquired fame with a large grain of salt, and he always wanted to talk about what others did rather than what he did during the war. I was distinctly honored to know him, and Bill Granieri will live in my heart forever. Currahee, Bill. God bless you, and keep you in the palm of his hand. Captain Dale Dye, U.S. Marine Corps retired, military advisor, Band of Brothers. And now we have tributes from Bruce McKenna and Matthew Leach. What does one say about Bill Garnier that hasn't been already said? The man was incredible. I remember the first time I met him. It was at the Denver reunion. I was researching band. I came in the room. I see him in his crutches, this old guy. And boy, I hope he, I hope he makes it through the interview. Four hours later, lots of vodka tonics. I'm dead in bed, slept late, hung over. And as far as I know, Bill never went to bed. The whole four days of the reunion. I don't think Bill ever went to sleep. His vitality was staggering and inspiring to me. As everyone knows, the man was, he was a force of nature. He was incredibly helpful, researching band. He sent me letters. He pointed out who to talk to. He was, he was blunt with his assessments of, of the men, but caring and loving about their failures as well as his own. And he was also vocal about our failings on the show, which I think is important. But we couldn't have done it without him, without his joie de vivre, his just ir irrepressible nature. He was just a fantastically energetic and vital man and an inspiration to me as well as to my children. I, I don't think anybody can forget him in Paris. All those guys at five in the morning shutting down the bar. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to go up to bed. And to be honest, I was always just a little bit nervous to leave my wife in a room alone with Bill, which I think also speaks highly of him. And God, I hope I'm like that when I'm 90 years old. Or going into the Renaissance Hotel in Hollywood after band came out, going up to Bill and Babe's room and thinking I'd gone to the wrong room because their room was strewn with vodka bottles and food and pizza containers and I half expected to see naked groupies draped over the couch in the corner. And that's what that was great about Bill. He never stopped living. He never stopped trying. He never gave up. He was tough, the toughest, and he was loyal. And those are things that I will take to my grave, his virtues. I'm sure he was flawed, as his family can tell you, but we're all flawed. And Bill knew he was flawed, and yet he just balls to the wall, lived his life to the fullest. So Bill, wherever you are right now, I suspect you're in Paris, 1944. God help those French women, because you got both legs and they're on the run, and that's where you deserve to be. You earned it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for what you did, you and your generation. We will never forget you. We will never forget you. God bless. Hi, it's Matt Leach. I played Floyd Talbot. I really, really wish I could be there. And I'm so sorry that this message has to be so short. But I just wanted to say, Bill, today you make the transition from hero into legend. Pretty amazing stuff. We love you, Bill. We miss you. But the stories are just going to get better. I'm the grandchild of two World War II veterans. Both of my grandfathers were of D-Day as well. And if you have a relative, and this ceremony reminds me of that tonight, who's living, get them to share their stories if they will. What a wonderful treasure that Bill's family has to have his stories, not just shown on HBO, but these personal accounts that we can all watch here tonight. 
I just did it with my grandfather, who's going to be 92, who was in the Army Air Corps. And now I have that for my little son. So try and do that, even if it's on your smartphone. Just remember that so you can have these memories and show them to generations and share these stories as well. I'm honored to read another letter tonight. Not all Sons of Liberty are from the streets of Philadelphia, nor do they warrant such a name as Wild Bill Grenieri. Only one did. Only the man whose wild life was lived to its fullest while missing one limb. Wild Bill Grenieri never called himself a hero. A patriot? Yes. Paratrooper? Yes, sir. Wild man? Absolutely. He was all of those things for all of his days. But the heroes, he said, were the fellows who left this world and never returned from the fields. From fields and ruins of Europe between June 6, 1944 and May 15th, a short year later. The heroes, said Bill, never had the chance to come home or have kids, to grow old, to sip beer on the street corner or dance on one leg at reunions long past the millennium. The heroes were left behind, said Wild Bill Grenieri, and were no longer with us, and now neither is he. And so it is that William Grenieri has joined the ranks of those who passed us by years ago, those boys of the free world, the sons of cities like Philadelphia, who went off to save the world, as heroes do. Goodbye, Wild Bill. We were lucky to have known heroes like you, Tom Hanks. God bless you, Wild Bill, and thank you to the family for having me here tonight. Uncle Fiducci, they used to call me. What does that mean? Well, that's the sort of respect for the elderly people. You were taught, actually, from the day you were born, you respect your elders no matter what. That's it. If you didn't respect them, you got a old back of a hand. And they used to call all the old time Uncle Fiducci. So now, I'm, I'm, now I'm an old time, and they call me Uncle Fiducci, which is nice. Okay, so um, I'd, I'd like to, first of all, if I could, uh, acknowledge uh, John Guarneri and also his son, John Jr., uh, because of that eloquent introduction I gave. I couldn't write anything like that. They did it, and uh, I thought that they should be acknowledged and knew that. He'll be coming up later on. And his words were so beautiful. You know, I, I, was, I, I was trying to think of the right thing to say, and, and, and John had written it, and it was beautiful. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a minute before we introduce our next guest. And, um, and our final uh, honoree here, uh, honor or excuse me. Um, you know, I'm, ju I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a military supporter of, of no end, and you know, with Wild Bill and also with Babe and all of you men and women here that served in our country, and uh, you know, and everybody is um, as fans and you know, they looked at some of the stuff that I did on special teams, and you know, they called me a warrior. You know, they told me you were a tough guy, and you know, you're talking about going to war. I mean, forget about it. That's not even close to the things that you experienced and what you went through. And and I never forget there was this one ball player uh, that's no longer with the Eagles, but he was whining about getting a second chance. And uh, I had just read, uh, I just visited uh, Walter Reed Hospital. And I was as nervous as hell going in there. I mean, what can me, what can I do to, to motivate those young men and women there that lost their limbs uh, out there protecting our dream? And, uh, and as I'm coming home, I, I ran into James Brown. You know, the guy you see on TV that does the pregame stuff. Hey, Vinny, how's it going? What's going on? And he could see that I was like, <gasps> but, you know, and he says, what's going on? I said, I just visited Walter Reed. I can't believe it. I'm just blown away by what I saw there. And he said, write about it. Write it down right now. So I did. So I'm going to share with you just be a little bit of my writing and, and the feelings I have about men and women and, and those like Wild Bill and, and Babe and, and everybody here and everybody in the service. And it's, it'll just take a second, then I'll introduce our next, uh, our next person. And, and it's about these men and women, uh, they signed on to their team, and that's, of course, the, the, the service, to protect the American dream, and we're giving no signing bonuses. They get no press conferences, no guarantees. Uh, their uniforms are worn with pride. 
They're not adorned with corporate logos. Uh, just medals and stripes earned through blood, sweat, and tears, not entitlement. And it has USA on the front. And men, like Wild Bill, they don't second guess their coaches and their superiors. They simply execute the play that they're asked to run. And they scoff these warriors at the arrogance of entitlement, holding to the truth that nobody ever drowned in sweat. You got to earn what you get. And they risk their lives every day to make sure our dreams come true. And in the end, their dreams were shattered. And uh, that's how I feel about you, military. So thank you very much. And, um, and, and, and I'm very proud, and, and, and I thought this would be a great prelude and segue, and this is our, our, our final introduction for the evening, uh, that I introduced to you a guy who's a 40-year military uh, career, had a 40-year military career. You know him as the judge down at Veterans Stadium, right? But he's, and, and he's Justice Seamus P. McCaffrey, and he made a career uh, serving as city, commonwealth, and country, a combined 74 years of public service. And uh, he's right around from here, Cardinal Doherty High School, joins the U.S. Marines uh, right after 68, retires in 2008 at the rank of full colonel with 40 years of service, as I had said. He's gotten so many military honors, the five meritorious, meritorious service medals, the War on Ter Terrorism Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, and then he completed his active military service, uh, Justice McCaffrey returned home, and then he became a cop of the Philadelphia Police Department for 20 years. And then in 93, he became the first retired police officer ever elected as a trial judge in Philadelphia County, and later appointed to administrative judge of municipal court in 2001. And in 2003, he's elected a judge of the Pennsylvania Superior Court, and later elected a justice of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in 2007. There he is, riding in on his Harley, Justice Seamus McCaffrey. <laughs> Sorry, man. Couldn't help myself. Oh, no, no. Look at that ring. <laughs> Good evening. I really apologize for making you all wait so late because uh, Jim Kenny was supposed to be the last one, but you know politicians, they jump in front of you. I'm only on the Supreme Court. He just jumps in front of me and leaves. Um, I'm honored, I truly am honored to be here tonight because, quite frankly, my 40 years in the military um, was by my own choosing because, as an immigrant, somebody not born in this country, uh, I never took this great nation for granted. I wanted to serve as long as I could. Um, most of my career in the military, I was in the reserves, um, and every time I've been around real warriors, I've been humbled, really humbled to be in their presence. Uh, there's an awful lot of them here tonight, a lot of these Vietnam guys that I've had the honor or privilege of being around. Jimmy Doherty, where are you at? You were here, Jimmy? You know, I know you're here somewhere. Jimmy's in the back. You know, this is a, a pathfinder. You know, the first guy that goes into combat. Where's Big John? All you guys from the 101st, 82nd Airborne, please stand up. Stand up. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I spent 10 years as an enlisted man, 30 years in the officer corps. I'm a full colonel, and I am humbled to be in their presence, really. Because honestly, they have served their country in combat. Not that that takes away from those of us that didn't serve in combat, but these men and women now really, really, really have put their lives on the line for our nation. And when I'm in their presence, when I see the Purple Hearts when I see the CIBs, the combat infantry badges for the Army guys, you know, it really makes me just say, you know, they are real warriors, and I'm just humbled to be in their presence. When I got a call from, you know, Debbie to come out and speak for her grandfather, you know, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. Wait, why would they want a Marine, an Air Force colonel, to come out here and speak about an airborne guy, World War II hero? And upon further reflection, I thought to myself, well, to jump out of a perfectly good airplane, you can't be very bright. So she probably couldn't find very many bright people from the Airborne Division to speak. So she needed a guy like me who she thought was bright. Little did she know I'm pretty dull. But Wild Bill, and I hear everybody talking about Wild Bill, Wild Bill, and his great sense of humor. I've had the pleasure of being in his company, and I mean that. First time I saw Wild Bill Grenier, I said, wow. And everybody was around him, talking to him, and I just sat over in the corner and watched him. I watched him because I was in awe. 
This is a man who lost his leg but did not lose his sense of humor. This is a man who gave so much for our nation and did not give up a whole lot of courage, patriotism. Just Wild Bill was more than Wild Bill. When you read about him, when you hear about him, when you really get down and think about what he was about, I don't like to use the term Wild Bill because people characterize, you know, people, yeah, he's wild, he's crazy. To me, he's brave, Bill. Think about that. Anybody here ever be or see or be around artillery? For those of us that have, it's terrifying. Thank God I've only been there when it was outgoing. I can't imagine for the life of me being anywhere near incoming artillery. It is absolutely terrifying. While Bill Granieri was in the middle of a battle where the German 88 howitzers were raining down on him. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that don't know anything about military hardware, an 88 round was at that time one of the most vicious of all artillery rounds in World War II. They actually found men in trenches, dead, without a single scratch on them. A round was so fast going by, it would suck the air out of your lungs. These things were incredibly vicious at the time. Nothing could stop them. And yet, in the middle of an artillery barrage, then Staff Sergeant Granieri was running around saving his men, pulling a wounded comrade, comrade, comrade into safety. That's not wild. That's brave. That's heroism like I've never imagined. Honestly, you know, and I think, hey, I'm a tough guy. I'd be cowering in the corner. I really would. I like to think that I could jump up there and charge. Let me tell you something, folks. It takes a special person. I've been around. I've been in my, look, and, and people say, Seamus, you spent 40 years in the military. You ever been in combat? Nope. Every single shooting I've been in my life has been here in Philly. <laughs> true, true. And guess what? You get a round coming by your head, a round, a little bullet. You're saying the decades of the rosary. You're saying, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. I can't imagine, imagine an artillery barrage. And here's this skinny little Italian kid from South Philadelphia with you know what bigger than most of us up there running around saving his troops, caring about his men before himself. That's not wild, folks. That's brave. That's brave. You know, when I first met him and I got the chance to talk to him a few times, his humor was amazing. So, of course, me, you know, I got to bust him a little bit. And I said, Bill, is it true that Army means ain't ready for Marines yet? And, you know, he gave me that steely look, and I just did a Michael Jackson moonwalk. I figured, you know, he may be old, but I'm afraid he may not be that slow. And that big long cane he had would look pretty bad sticking out of some place in me. I would tease him about, is it true that the only thing that comes out of the sky is bird shit and fools? And now I knew I was getting his temper up, because he liked, you know, he laughed. And I told him the story my kid brother who was in the first air cab always used to tell me. Seamus, you know what marine means? Muscles are required, intelligence not essential. <laughs> it's nice to see the kind of camaraderie we all have in the military, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, whatever it may be. Those men and those women are absolutely different people. They really are the blood of our nation. But I seriously am humbled to be here to just thank the Granieri family uh, and to say, Bill, Brave Bill, our brave Bill, um, I love you, I honor you, I respect you. Um, to all you men and women out here, you know, what I consider to be my real world warriors, um, I commend you, I thank you for your service. And, and again, please, um, you're all just great Americans. Thank you for being here for Bill. I'm sure this place would have been filled to the rafters if the weather was a little bit better. Um, but as I said, we're here because we love the man, we love the legend, and let's not let him die off and be forgotten because he's a once-in-a-lifetime person. And I'm sure he and Babe are up there right now just giggling and laughing, and I hope they're having one hell of a time uh, because we're just a bunch of humble patriots here to give our thanks to great Americans like him.
Thank you so much. God bless you. Stay well. Uh, how great was that? Best closer you could have, right? And, uh, and, and I'm going to echo your thoughts, uh, uh, Judge and, and, and Seamus, and I want to thank the Guarneri family who's in front of me here uh, for the honor of having uh, this opportunity to serve as EMC and to honor one true great American, and, and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to have one more video tribute, but before that, you know, uh, this is all about the dream, and I'm going to leave you with this one. Happy are those who dream dreams and are willing to pay the price to make their dreams come true. So many in this room have paid the price, certainly Wild Bill Guarneri paid the price, and uh, we thank him for it. We love him for it. We'll never forget him. So with that, one last video tribute. Have a great night. Go Flyers. I love you guys. Love Philly, and we'll see you all later. Bye-bye. Hello, or should I say Yowza, as my grandfather would always say when you called him, followed by a how you doing, sweetheart. We heard a lot of stories and saw a lot of clips of the man that lost his leg in episode seven. Wild Bill was a real life character. He was very animated and had his very own sound effects. He was fearless brave, thoughtful, brutally honest, and a real jokester. Gramps adored his wife, protected his family, and he loved South Philly. Wild Bill loved to gamble, drink coffee, and eat hot dogs. He loved to answer boxes and boxes of letters that um, children wrote him, and he answered every one. He also shared a love for cars with both of his sons, Gene and Billy. But his most commendable attribute was his generosity. Gramps would give you the shirt off his back or the hat off his head, which he did on many occasions. It is because of his generosity 
my cousin John and I decided to have this memorial celebration to honor such a great man, not only that risked his life for his country, but also continued helping others until the day he died. We believe this is the start of a great foundation. The Wild Bill Garnier Memorial Fund will allow his family to carry on his great legacy. And I know from the bottom of my heart, this is what my grandfather would want us to do. Wild Bill donated to many veterans charities and individuals in need throughout his life. Through fundraising efforts, the Guarneri family would love to keep the tradition going in Wild Bill's name so that his name and his generosity will live on forever. We are thrilled that the money we raised has exceeded the amount we needed for this memorial, so I am proud to say we will be able to start donating this year. With the help from his family and friends, we can keep this great American hero's name alive by donating to this memorial fund. Our family wanted to honor this great American hero who never deemed himself a hero. I am grateful for everyone here today and especially thankful for all the help we received from this celebration, especially Annie, Derek, Nikki, and Michelle, whose efforts haven't gone unnoticed. And I want to assure my children that I will start cooking dinner again, maybe Thursday. And last but not least, I am forever indebted to my friend and my cousin, John Garneri. Thank you, Deb. Uncle Bill was a hero to me far before I knew he was a hero to the world. As stated earlier, this generation of men did not come back from the war and brag of their heroics, yet they chose to honor and praise those who could not speak, those who were left in Europe. If I may give you a football analogy, in a day and age where a football player catches a 10-yard pass, jumps up and down, spins the ball like a top, this generation would have played in that game, scored five touchdowns, handing the ball each and every time to the ref, and after the game, they would praise their offensive linemen for blocking and thank the fans for coming. An amazing group of men. Uncle Bill was a hero to me, and why not? Who could not idolize a guy that brightened the room when he walked into it? An outstanding storyteller, animated. It's the funniest guy you ever wanted to be around. He could go to a wedding or a party and liven it up. He'd also go to a funeral, a hospital, or a place of mourning and make you feel okay. I remember when my dad died, I was crushed. And there's Uncle Billy sitting on the steps of South Philadelphia, holding court with the family, telling stories of my dad and his other brothers. No one was crying. People were smiling, if not outwardly laughing. He then went into the kitchen to check on my mom. And he said, Lee, how you doing, kid? My mom looked up. He said, it's just me and you left. Damn, you're getting to be an old hag. <laughs> well, my mom was stubborn. My mom had to outlast Uncle Bill. She passed nine days after he did. And I was at my brother Michael's house again in South Philadelphia, and something was missing. Who would cheer us up? Who would raise our spirits? Kind of gloomy. Until I told the Wild Bill story, and then someone else did. And all of a sudden, we weren't gloomy. We weren't, we weren't mourning anymore. We were laughing. Okay, it amazed me that while Bill wasn't there, yet found a way to raise our spirits. It was then that I realized that while Bill will be with us forever. I also remember my wedding day. I'm sitting at the table with my beautiful young bride, and Uncle Bill came racing across the dance floor. Man, he could move on those crutches, or he called them sticks had it right to my wife, and said, here you go, sweetheart, you look beautiful. Handed her an envelope. Don't spend it all in one place. Thank you, Uncle Bill. I asked, are you having a great time, Uncle? Not really, kid. Didn't you see? 
they threw me out of the hokey pokey for not putting my right leg in. <laughs> well, I laughed, and I caught a glimpse of my wife, kind of surprised, and I was like, welcome to the Garnieri family. <laughs> it was much later on in life that I found out that these jokes, especially the leg jokes, had a dual meaning. A, it was to be funny as hell, and he always was. But B, he wanted you to be comfortable with his leg, because God knows he was. He didn't want you awkward. I remember Frank John Hughes telling me in Las Vegas that he had an awkward moment trying to talk about Uncle Billy's leg, but playing a part he would have to. So all the actors were going to Bastogne to tour, and he asked the veterans who were staying, you guys need anything in Bastogne? Very quickly, Uncle Bill shouts, hey Frank, while you're in Bastogne, see if you can find my leg. <laughs> well, so much for being awkward. And that's what I meant. How could you look at a guy with one leg and never, I mean never, look at him as handicapped? Because he wasn't. He was iconic. If I may share one last story with you, it was so cool, it was almost out of a Clint Eastwood or Marlon Brando movie, again on a trip to Las Vegas. After five hours in a plane in the airport, Uncle Bill could hardly wait to light up. So as my dad, my brother Michael, and I get out and get into the cab, we get into a cab, big hefty cab driver, my dad in the front seat, my brother, Uncle Bill, and I in the back. I can remember that devilish grin as he pulls his cigarette. Of course, please, no smoking. He lights up out the window. He had a twinkle in his eye out the window. It didn't take long. The cab driver smelled it. Are you smoking back there? Yeah, why, kid? <laughs> Proudly tapping his sign. Can't you read the sign? Sure I do, kid. You don't smoke? No, I don't smoke. Do you drink, kid? Kind of confused. No, I don't drink. You some kind of health nut? Yes. You got a mirror at home? Now totally perplexed, the cab driver says, yes, I have a mirror at home. Almost down to the butt. But do me a favor, kid. Go home and look in the damn mirror, because you don't look too goddamn good to me. Out the, wig, out the window, he flicks the cigarette. Well, I don't know what was funnier, the look on that cab driver's face, or my dad, 87, getting out of that cab at the Stardust, hollering at his 80-year-old younger brother, Billy, are you going to do this the whole goddamn trip? <laughs> and without hesitation, why certainly, Gus. And he did, and it was another blast of a vacation. <laughs> well, Unc, in closing, I like to say, I'm going to miss that smile. I'm going to miss that devilish grin. I'm going to miss that twinkle in those eyes. I'm going to miss your jokes. I'm going to miss your stories. Most of all, Unc, I'm going to miss making stories with you. But I realize today that you're with your beautiful wife, Franny, my dad, the rest of your brothers and sisters, and you're with the most amazing generation that ever walked the face of this earth, your band of brothers. And they, Unc, deserve your story, stories far more than we do. And I am positive that you will keep them laughing for the rest of eternity. Down here, Unc, I promise you that I will do my part in keeping your legacy going for as long as I can. I love you, Unc. I miss you, Unc. You'll always be my hero. Thanks for the memories, kid. On behalf of Deborah and I and the entire Guarneri family, I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank Deb. Thank get half of them, please. You, thank you. And as my uncle would say, drive home safe, have a good night, and don't let the door hit you in the ass. <laughs>